A couple of years ago, I recorded um, a video that I called What It's Like Not Having Multiple Sclerosis. Um, at that time, I was going through a lot of uh, really sort of confusing <laughs> physical symptoms and actually some um, psychological, uh, mental, emotional symptoms as well. I had no idea what was going on, and um, it was a difficult time. Well, now I know what was going on, and um, so I thought I would post this update because what led me to answers uh, could be useful for other people, potentially. Um, I'm not very comfortable recording videos like this, so... Uh, sorry, you get what you get. I probably will ramble a little bit. But um, I thought it might be useful to go through a list of my symptoms chronologically uh, because I think that people listening to this, um, you know, if you're looking for answers to what's wrong with you, uh, you may be able to identify. Um, however, my symptoms cover a very broad range of um of physical and mental issues, and um, so it may or may not apply to you, but it may very well apply to somebody you know, if not you, and um, I'll explain why shortly. Um, also, I thought I would go through my diagnostic process, um, including the tests that I've had and um, the outcomes of those tests. So, uh, so I guess I will start um, around 2010, I started experiencing some really um, life-altering symptoms. Uh, basically, I went for a walk, um, and, uh, well, actually, I'll start before then. All right, around 2009, um, I had a long commute to work. I was driving probably, um, you know, depending on traffic, an hour and a half to two hours each way into Washington, D.C. from Virginia. And I started having problems with my vision in the dark. Um, I had, I, for a long time, I had just gotten used to this thing where my vision would become blurry on and off, um, sort of unpredictably, but my night vision by this time was really um, scary. I would have a lot of difficulty um, just seeing the road a lot of times, so I would be entirely dependent sometimes at night on um, the reflective stripes um, or, or dashed lines on the road and signs to sort of orient myself. It really felt like I was flying through space sometimes. That's how vision, that's how bad my vision was. Um, and so that, that was kind of untenable. And then um, more and more, my leg, one of my legs, either of them, would just go completely numb. Um, during long drives, and that became a problem, obviously, um, when I couldn't actually feel the pressure of my foot on the accelerator or brake of my car. So, um, that those were motivating reasons for moving into the city and walking back and forth to work. Um, I like walking anyway. My life was really sedentary because of all this time um, that, you know, I was spending commuting. And so um, I had been an, a very active person. I used to bike, you know, maybe 40 miles a week, 35 or 40 miles every weekend. Um, and I like to walk around. So anyway, I um, decided to invest in moving into this wonderful little studio apartment. Um, and I had a walk, um, a short walk to work. So I also used to just go walking around the neighborhood. I love, um, you know, exploring urban environments and things. And um, so one day in 2010, this brings me to where I was about to start. Um, also, my mind goes off in tangents. So, uh, you know, you may or may not be able to bear with me here. But I was going for this long walk. Um, and it was in April of 2010. And while I was walking... Um, just something really strange happened. I stepped off the curb into the street, and I honestly felt like there had been an earthquake. It, it felt like the ground shook underneath me, and everything was shaking. And at the same time, um, I got these sort of electrical jolts through my feet and my lower legs. Um, it was a sensation I hadn't really felt before, except that, um, 
if you know if your feet fall asleep you get the the tingling in your feet and legs and it was similar to that but it was a lot worse than that it really felt like um I don't know I stepped into a puddle um with an electrical wire in it or something so it was stunning and it really confused me and as soon as I got my bearings I realized that um, I looked around it was a really busy beautiful April day and I noticed nobody was reacting um, as if there had been an earthquake which again I, I really thought that it didn't make any sense there had never at that time um, in my lifetime been an earthquake in DC so it just didn't make any sense but once I realized nobody you know everyone was just going on about their business there was no commotion um, I thought oh you know this had to have been me this was me something just happened um, vertigo or something so I my mind was a little bit stunned um, and I tried to walk the rest of the way home uh, but I couldn't make it home on my own I, I found the nearest metro stop and I um, took a train back and the metro is like two blocks from my home so um, anyway I made it back and I was basically in bed for two to three days I had to call in sick because the electrical pain in my feet was just so terrible um, every time I took a step um, it's that pins and needles type of pain I don't really know how else to describe it if you've had it you will be able to relate to it. Um, it's called peripheral neuropath neuropathy. Um, I didn't know anything about it at the time. So it, right after that, I had to go out of town for a conference, and I just happened to um, mention this to somebody. It was really strange, and, and they were happened to be a doctor and said, you know, I don't mean to alarm you, but you probably will want to go to your doctor and um, get a referral to a neurologist because this sounds like it could be multiple sclerosis. Um, he said, you know, you look you look like you're probably too thin to have diabetes unless you had type 1 diabetes and you would have known that in childhood. So uh, you probably don't have type 2 diabetes. Um, get checked for a neurological condition like MS. So that did alarm me. Um, at the same time, uh, I was really depressed at the time, having to do a lot of, with a lot of different issues. Um, and so that will come into play in a minute as well. Um, I'm already seven minutes in, but uh, let's see. So my symptoms picked up quickly. So I did go to a doctor. This doctor was initially alarmed by my symptoms, and um, he did a whole bunch of tests. I think it took me a while to find a doctor, I should also mention. Um, being in Washington, D.C., not having had a doctor here, I had to call around, I think, about two dozen offices before I would find anybody who would take me. Um, everyone said, we're not accepting new patients. Um, a couple of places said, we're only accepting new patients who have HIV. Um, that was alarming to me. Uh, being gay, I have had this phobia of HIV all my life, and I actually wrote an article about this uh, during this process. Um, I, because of the shame and guilt associated with HIV throughout all my life, not not guilt, um, but stigma, a hyper awareness about it. Growing up gay in the eighties and nineties, this was the thing I feared in life, and um, it felt like you know it. I, I would be responsible if if I were so irresponsible and contracted it. So I was just scared to death of that. Um, however, I couldn't that I had no control over this at this point. I went to this doctor, and the reason I brought up HIV is because um, that was actually the first thing the doctor said. He said, "Have you been tested for HIV?" I'm sure he was profiling me, you know, based on um, my being gay and everything. And I said, yeah, I'm tested every six months, but, um, you know, let's get tested. Uh, and so he did that. He also sent me for MRIs of my brain and, um, all three sections of my spine, my cervical, um, thoracic and lumbar. And, uh, all of those MRIs were normal. There were no abnormal signal flares, which is what, um, doctors are looking for when they're testing for multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis actually means multiple scars, and those scars are signal flares that show up on MRIs. Um, you, <laughs> Along this process, you learn a lot of um, medical information that actually doctors 
seem to get annoyed that, that you understand um, when you're asking them questions about these things. But you have to learn these things on your own along this process. Um, so my MRIs were normal, no signal flares. Um, and so, and my, my HIV test was negative. All of my blood work was pretty normal. There were a couple of minor abnormalities, but the doctors did not consider those significant. So I did go to, um, a neurologist and he looked at my MRIs and he said, well, your MRI is normal. Let's give you an EMG. Um, EMG is electromyog... E <laughs> electro uh, myograph or electromyography. Um, and there are actually two parts of this test. It's a nerve conduction veloci velocity test in CV. And that part of the test, they hook up electrodes to you and administer a shock. And um, it's it, basically it feels like hitting your funny bone, except they uh, also test, for example, your um, sciatic nerve in the back of your leg, and that's a huge voltage, and it makes your whole body convulse. It looks uh, just like when you see on television or in a movie um, somebody getting shock therapy. Like, your whole body just, like, reacts like a fish out of water. It's, it's disturbing. The other part of the test, they actually stick needles into your body in various places because of the extent of my symptoms. They did both of my arms and, um, or sorry, they did one of my arms, both of my legs and my feet, and they stick these long needles, about this long, um, very narrow needles though, into your muscle and um, bend the needles and have you bend the muscles, and that way they're measuring the electrical conduction within your muscles. Um, it was torture. Torture. Uh, <laughs> if you read about EMGs online, it says you'll experience some mild discomfort. Uh, the doctor said, do you, basically, do you know what you're getting into here? And I said, yeah, I read about it. I can handle discomfort. Um, I have had, because of scarring from acne on my face, I've had laser treatment that was very painful, and I thought, oh, I can handle this. Well, it's not mild discomfort, and he actually said, yeah, this is going to be very painful, but it's an important test. Um, if you have, basically, this EMG was to rule out ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, which is um, when your nerves basically start to die from the outside in instead of um, a central nervous system disorder, which is your brain and spine. The MRI tests for the CNS disorders. Um, the EMG tests to um, find out if your nerves um, from the tips inward are dying. Um, or failing for some reason. And they also give EMGs to test for carpal tunnel syndrome, for example. And what it does basically is it looks for leaking um, of the electrical signal. Um, and so anyway, that test was normal as well. So this doctor sat down with me and said, okay, well, here's the good news. Um, all of your tests are normal. Your blood work is pretty much normal. This is important too, pretty much normal. Um, your MRIs are totally normal, and your EMGs are totally normal. This is really good news. This means that you don't have MS, as far as we can tell. You don't have ALS, which is great, because ALS is sort of the worst-case scenario. And, um, and at this point, he said, here's what I could do. I could order other, um, more expensive sort of, um more intensive tests like a nerve, like a um, skin biopsy to look at your nerve endings. And he said, but um, if you want me to be honest with you, he said, you seem to be perfectly healthy and fine. And he asked me about my job. Is your job stressful? Well, yeah, my job is stressful, but whose job isn't stressful, especially in this area? Um, and um, so he said, well, here's what I would recommend you should take a long vacation, you should learn to relax, and you might want to look into counseling. And uh, so basically, I, I, I was offended. I could not help 
being offended. I was relieved to find out that according to this doctor, I don't have MS um, or ALS, which again, that, that would have been disastrous news, I think. Um, and, but at the same time, it, you know, it was like, basically it felt like he was implying this was all made up. I don't know. Um, you know, at that time I thought, does he think that I'm doing this for attention or does he think that I'm mentally ill? Um, what he said was, I don't think you're doing this for attention. I think something is really, you're feeling that something is wrong with your body. And, um, he, he said, you know, it's not necessarily mental illness, but anxiety can manifest as physical problems. Um, and so, you know, counseling might be helpful, an antidepressant might be helpful, anti-anxiety medications might be helpful, things like that. So, um, you know, I got over myself and I actually did start going to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist um, basically, um, I won't go into the whole psychiatric process. I've been seeing my psychiatrist for the past five years and um, she has been a tremendous benefit in my life. Uh, help me manage a lot of symptoms. To be honest, I don't know if I would be here now um, if I didn't have the support of this person who has really um, held my hand along this process, helped me understand how to cope and all of these different things, and also, really importantly, told me, you know, you're not crazy. Um, something is going on with your body. Maybe it's a, con a what's called a conversion disorder, which is where your brain actually converts anxiety into physical problems, like actual physical health problems. Um, and maybe something is actually wrong with you. Unfortunately, there's no way to know that for sure. So basically, um, she put band-aids on it by prescribing antidepressants, anti-anxiety disorders, and even Seroquel, which is um, an atypical antipsychotic. The reason she prescribed that in its lowest dose was to help me sleep. Um, her theory was that if you get more restful sleep, maybe your brain will be able to calm down and maybe um, that will have a positive effect on some of your symptoms. So um, those really at this point I'm calling those band-aids because what happened was um, I learned to cope with life. I managed. I've been able to go to work every day but it didn't prevent anything from progressing to worse cases. So I um, developed tremors. I developed increased uh, memory problems. Um, decreased concentration. I started dropping things a lot more often. I would stumble. Um, a few times I actually sort of fell into the wall at work because my um, balance was off. Um, just all of these things that are really consistent with multiple sclerosis. And, uh, you know, from time to time I went back to doctors. I ended up going back to another neurologist, um, at a certain point, and they they took me very, very, very seriously. Unlike the first one, um, who dismissed me offhand pretty quickly, um, they spent a whole lot of time with me, and they gave me, um, they ordered more MRIs, they gave me another EMG, which was far less painful um, than the first one, um, the different approaches to the EMG instead of uh, just checking everything as deeply as they could. They checked um, for the basics to make sure that my nerves were okay and then said, okay, we don't need to torture you any further. That's actually what they said to me. Um, at no time did this doctor say, this is all in your head. Uh, so they ordered additional tasks. Uh, they did EEGs of my brain patterns. They did what's called evoked potentials visual and auditory. Um, and again, they determined that pretty much everything was normal. There were a few abnormalities that were not explained and were considered, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the term. Anyway, the, the, oh, congenital, that I was born with these issues. One of them was that um, I have abnormally brisk knee-jerk reflexes um, with clonus, which is, is pretty abnormal. And the other was that I was sent to a neuro-ophthalmologist, and he noticed that I have a 
blurry optic nerve disc margin, which, um, what does that mean? Who knows? Well, I read about it, and it turns out that can be a major concern as well, um, often relating to a degenerative central nervous system disorder, like multiple sclerosis. So, um, but again, there wasn't any real evidence of MS. In order to be diagnosed with MS, you have to have um, multiple scars. That's what multiple sclerosis means, meaning multiple signal flares showing up on your MRIs, either in your brain or in your central nervous system. Um, and you need to have a specific constellation of symptoms. I did have several of those, but without any physical scarring showing up on the MRIs, then it doesn't mean anything. Um, and then they can also do a spinal tap, um, or a lumbar puncture is the technical name. They drain some spinal fluid and they look for what are called illegal clonal bands. Um, I may have mispronounced that, but, um oligoclonal bands, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, I did not have that test because my doctor said, um, you know, despite all of your symptoms, uh, without something showing up on your MRI, basically, if you don't have the signal flare showing up on your MRI or the scars, um, the myelin coating chipping off of your nerves, um, if there's no evidence of that, we couldn't diagnose you anyway, even with the bands, um, these little protein bits floating around in your spinal fluid, so we don't want to torture you with a lumbar puncture um, until we see something on your MRIs. So, okay, all of the MS stuff behind me, um, sort of, I, I continue to have all of these nerve issues, but they would come and go, which again, that sort of happens with multiple sclerosis a lot of the time. Um, Going forward to 2012, I was feeling a little bit better, and then in November of 2012, I, you know, I was just after work one day, um, 7 p.m., important, um, the timing, I got this, this aching right in the middle of my right eye, which, again, this is the eye with the optic, optic nerve issue. Um, and by the time I realized that my eyeball was aching, it had turned into the most intense extreme pain. Um, the only way that I can describe it is it feels like somebody took a live electrical wire, shoved it directly into the middle of my eyeball, and just sort of went like this with it, um, increasing the voltage for about an hour. It was, it's so extraordinarily painful. Um, and then it passed after about an hour, and I was just like, what the hell happened to me? Is that what a migraine is? What's going on? Um, so I, I didn't have any idea what to do with that. All I could think was, this is neurological, um, right? Because I had been to neurologists for all this time. So I'm looking up MS and eyeball pain. I'm not really finding anything because MS is so many different symptoms. Um, and then the next night, 7 o'clock p.m., it happens again. The next day, I dreaded 7 p.m. coming. Nothing happened. And then the next night, um, you know, I'm like, what is something going to happen? Is it not? 7 p.m., same thing happened. Um, and by the third or fourth day, I called the neurologist's office back. Now, I had just been there recently, and they said, call us um, if one of three things happens. Um, either you have double vision for longer than one week, because I had had double vision for a couple of days at a time, um, but they said it's got to be longer than a week. Or you lose control of your bladder, and basically you pee all over yourself and can't control it. Give us a call. That's significant. Um, or you can't walk. Now, I had... One of the reasons I had gone to the second neurologist is that... Um, I, f I forgot to mention this. This was really alarming. Um, so I was walking down the, the DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. metro um, subway uh, escalator is very, very, very steep and long. And um, it's always broken, basically. I was walking down it one day, and my left leg stopped working entirely. 
um, completely. I had to hop down on my right leg, and by the time I got to the bottom, it was just basically hanging there. And I, I had the use of one leg. It was this, probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. Um, and so I went to the doctor because of that. So the third thing that they said is, um, so give us a call if you have double vision for longer than a week, if you can't control your bladder or bowels, or you can't walk for longer than a week. So none of these things had happened, but I had these insane eyeball attacks, and I thought, oh my god, this is very real. So I called the office, and I talked to the nurse, and she said, well, that doesn't sound like trigeminal neuralgia. And I, I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. And she said, well, that's associated with multiple sclerosis. What you're describing doesn't sound like that, because it doesn't just come for an hour and then go. So, um, this isn't really MS related. And I said, well, I, I don't care. I'm literally going to jump off the roof of my building if the, if I can't make this stop. And she said, well, there's not really anything we can do. Um, try taking aspirin or something, you know, have you, and I'm like, yes, of course I've tried that. <laughs> so, um, I was completely left hanging and I had no idea what was going on through, um, thanks to the internet, I discovered by process of elimination something called cluster headaches, which are uh, have been described by some neurologists, I wouldn't know, but as the possibly the most painful um, sensation a human being can experience. People, um, women who have had them have said that it's far more painful than childbirth. How would I know? All I know is that it is extraordinarily painful. They're called suicide headaches, and for good reason, um, really, because when it's happening, uh, you will do anything to stop it. I tried all kinds of things. Absolutely nothing helped. Um, when you get this headache, um, it's called a headache, but it's really your eye. Um, you get this pain. By the time you realize you're having the pain, it's, like I said, it's like an electrical wire being jabbed into your eyeball. It can last anywhere from 45 minutes to 90 minutes. Um, it comes on. You can't stop moving. You're, like, running around. It's sort of the opposite of a migraine in a certain way. Um, people with migraines usually need to be in the dark, perfectly still, no noise. When you get a cluster headache, you are literally trying to run from your body and cannot stop moving. Um, it happened to me at work a couple of times at 3.30 p.m., always at 3.30 or 7 p.m., and it happened to me um, in front of my family during Thanksgiving dinner, and I thought they were going to think I was crazy, but um, they didn't. They just thought, oh my god, something is really wrong with, um, with him, and... They were very compassionate. I don't know. So I went back to my psychiatrist and I said, am I crazy? I swear I am going to jump off the roof. I, I mean, there's nothing else I can do. That was all I could think is um, I cannot live this way. Well, these clus this cluster, they're called cluster headaches because they last for um, a specific period of time and then they stop. And then they always come back again in another cluster. The cluster is a series of days. Um, this happened to be November of 2012. And then by the end of the month, they stopped. Every day you sit around waiting for it to happen again. And one day it just didn't happen. And it actually has not happened since then. And that's, that's a true blessing. So um, December of 2012. I was uh, with my family, and out of nowhere I had a terrible stiff neck. My shoulders were killing me, my elbows were killing me, um, my knees were killing me, um, and I was basically, I could hardly move for several days, and then the pain got just slightly better. And then um, basically this joint pain lasted for about three months and it would move from joint to joint. None of this made any sense. It made absolutely no sense. So I'm, you know, looking up all this stuff about MS thinking, all right, I have MS and it's just not showing up on tests yet. But joint pain isn't, um, entirely consistent with MS. It's not as common as 
say, the um, foot and leg pain or the dizziness or the memory loss or what's called brain fog where you just can't concentrate or recall memories. Um, and so then I started reading about um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and thought, well, could that be it? Could I have some other autoimmune disorder like uh, lupus or something? Now, lupus um, often manifests with with what's called discoid, um, my computer just froze, uh, discoid, uh, basically, I can't think of what it's called, but a rash that's like acne on your cheeks. Well, I have terrible, um, acne scars from my teenage years, and I had these, these, like, God, I don't know, clusters of really thick acne that just ravaged the collagen in my cheeks when I was a teenager. So I thought, maybe that's it. Maybe I have lupus. Um, and I went to a rheumatologist. Um, and the reason I actually ended up going to the rheumatologist was I had this, this pain in the bottom of my foot. And it was so, so, so painful to walk. And um, like I said, I commute on foot to work. Um, driving is not the best option for me. And it was becoming so painful. So I went to this rheumatologist and she um, just randomly discovered that I have um, this lump on my hand, which I already knew. And she said that's something called depoitrins de de or something contracture. And it's an inflammation of the sheath here. That's all she wanted to talk about. And I said, I'm here because of foot pain and I think I need a bunch of blood tests to find out um, you know, if I have an autoimmune condition or something. And um, she just wasn't interested in doing that. And so I walked away from there deflated. It was really strange. So that was in 2013 or 14. And then I just decided, you know what, I'm going to live with this. Um, until I can't walk, until I meet one of those three criteria, my neurologist, who is really wonderful at Washington Hospital Center, I cannot say enough about this office. They were so patient with me, but I think they did everything they could, and then they ran out of testing options. And um, something I've learned, see, my foot's falling asleep now, and it's very painful, so I have to readjust. But um, what I learned with doctors is there are two things about um, doctors. One, I fault them for, one I don't fault them for. The thing I do not fault doctors for is um, they're limited to their options. Basically, what they're doing, when you have something like this, you know, that isn't an ear infection that they give you amoxicillin for, you know, or the flu or something, um, their options are go through a checklist. This is how they learn. Um, you know, with every patient, run down a checklist of symptoms and narrow down the checklist. It's a flow chart, basically. And um, once you get down to a few narrow options, administer tests. Based on those test results, that's your diagnosis. If the test results are all normal, your diagnosis is either, we don't know, which they never say, or um, there's nothing wrong with you. And it seems like the default diagnosis is um, they, so the compassionate doctors, I think, will say to a lot of people, um, instead of there's nothing wrong with you, they'll say, uh, you know, this could be anxiety. You'd be really surprised that anxiety can manifest in all kinds of ways, and it can be physical as well. You're not crazy, but you are a lot more stressed out than you think. And um, here, if you take this Zoloft, if you take Wellbutrin or Paxil or whatever, you'll be surprised how much better you feel. Um, or they send you to a therapist. Um, the less compassionate doctors will say, listen, there's nothing wrong with you. And they'll basically say, you know, you, you need something to do. You need something to occupy your mind. And basically, you need to stop bothering us because we have real patients to deal with. It's, it's very, very hard to hear that. And um, even though generally, um, you know, 
when something is wrong with your body. That's why I'm recording this video for anybody. Um, if anybody finds this and thinks, I know something's wrong with my body, but at this point, I don't know. Doctors keep telling me um, that there's nothing wrong, but I know there's something wrong, and it's just getting worse and worse, um, or it's hard to function from day to day. Well, you do know. You know when something is wrong with you. And people who you know, know that something is wrong with you. Whether it's um, an inability to concentrate, uh, that's my 7 a.m. alarm. I have to start getting ready for work. I woke up like this. Um, this is what I look like in the morning. But um, y you know, you know when something is wrong with you. And doctors, if they say it's anxiety, maybe it is, it is possible. Um, certainly anxiety contributes to a lot of symptoms if you have health problems, chronic health issues. Um, and, and so I'm about to get into my diagnosis and finding out what was really wrong with me, um, what is wrong with me, and among other things. But um, something I, I discovered um, recently is that anxiety is not only a cause of these symptoms, anxiety can physiologically be a symptom of um, some specific health issues, and that's what I'm about to discuss. Uh, so, here we go. Um, things got even weirder and even worse when, um, I'm going to try to find, okay change of scenery. Um, but things got even weirder and even worse recently. Um, I think it was about six months ago. I was getting ready for work one morning and I got a little dizzy spell, which happens to me frequently. But this one, um, just like I said, that clus those cluster headaches, you would feel them. And by the time you realize something was going on, it was so intense that I'm, it's, that's it. It had your full attention. Well, that's what happened with this. By the time I realized I was getting dizzy, um, I started feeling a little nauseated, which is um, far more extreme than the normal dizziness or vertigo that I've had. And I, I started to stand up because I felt like I might um, throw up. And I couldn't, I couldn't get up. I was so dizzy that I actually fell to the floor and I was completely disoriented. Um, I had to crawl into the bathroom and I threw up for probably about a half hour and I didn't know what was happening. I thought in my mind um, I'm having a seizure or I'm having a stroke and this could be it. This could be the end. Maybe I've had a brain tumor all along. Maybe something just didn't show up on the MRIs. I don't know. But I think I might actually die. And it was at this time of day. Um, it was around 7 a.m. And I ended up vomiting for about a half hour. Um, I couldn't function even well enough to use the phone. Um, so I couldn't call work. And I couldn't have even called 911. Um, I, what I did manage to do was flop myself over into the bathtub with my clothes on and turn on the cold water because I felt like my body was going to burst into flames. Um, and it was, I don't, I don't know how long it was, maybe an hour, uh, maybe longer. And then, um, I, the vertigo was improving, but it was not passing, and I was so completely exhausted. Um, I ended up crawling, crawling, because I still could not walk, back to bed in my sopping wet clothes, and I passed out, and I woke up about five hours later. And um, I was still very dizzy, but I wasn't... Um, I, I was lucid enough to um, get in touch with work. People had tried to contact me to make sure I was okay, and I wasn't okay. And um, the people I talked to said, it sounds like food poisoning. And I was like, "That's this is food poisoning? That's insane. Um, so within a couple of days, I went to the doctor because I was just feeling so... Um, 
I just couldn't drive myself anywhere before then. And the doctor gave me an EEG, ordered another MRI. So this was my third MRI in four years. MRI was normal. Uh, she, this doctor was trying to rule out um, what's called an acoustic neuroma, which is a tiny little tumor inside your ear. Um, she ruled that out. My brain was unremarkable, according to the MRI, as usual. My um, EKG was normal, my, so meaning my heart was okay, and uh, my blood work was normal. So, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> there was no explanation. And that, that was about the limit for me. That sent me plunging into the deepest, deepest depression. Now... Um, as I said, I've been seeing a psychiatrist for five years, and um, there there have been more often than not um, on weekends, I don't get out of bed or I don't get out of my apartment. I haven't been able to get out. Um, speaking with my psychiatrist, we've you know discussed this as a mental health issue, and she has thought that it was depression or anxiety. Social anxiety or just um, my lack of energy has had to do with being so, so depressed, a mental health issue. Um, and I, you know, I never had any reason to question that. Even sometimes when I don't feel sad, I thought, okay, well, you know, I guess that, that makes sense. So, all right. Um, but I've been so exhausted for so many years, I haven't describe that as a symptom, but that's just my day-to-day -day life. I'm, um, somehow I'm able to make it to work most days, and that's it. I get home and I crash. I go to bed at, um, eight o'clock, maybe, sometimes seven. Sometimes I stay up as late as nine or nine thirty. Um, I'm 37 years old. This has been going on, uh, since I was 32, and, um, so it's, I don't have a life, and I'm completely fatigued and exhausted. So this, this lack of a diagnosis after this vertigo episode just made me feel officially crazy. I thought, this, this is crazy. Um, on one hand, I knew for sure something is physically wrong with me. And basically what I settled on was... I think I had a seizure, um, and at some point this is going to happen again, and it's going to kill me, because I honestly felt like I was dying when this was happening. So, I was okay, um, you know, whatever, I, I have all these physical quirks and things, but um, I've learned to live with that. Um, and then I had some family health issues. My father had a major surgery for an aneurysm over the fall. Um, I was supposed to go to an ear, nose, and throat specialist, but because of um, various life issues, I put that off because I had to deal with so many other things. I got my MRIs. I, you know, have been going to all these other doctor's appointments. So um, I went to lunch with a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in a long time in January. And as soon as we got to, or it was brunch, um, so it was about 10 or 11 in the morning um, on a Sunday. As soon as we got there, I started feeling weird. And she thought I was having a panic attack because we actually used to be roommates. And she um, thought she was having a heart attack one time. And I took her to the ER. She was in her mid-20s. I thought, that's so crazy. You're not having a heart attack. It turned out she was having a panic attack. And her blood pressure was very elevated. So based on her personal history, she she was saying, you know, I think you're having a panic attack. Um, let's calm you down. Let's calm you down. Um, do you want to go to the ER? And I was like, no, I, I just, I couldn't think straight. Um, and then just like the first time that I got this vertigo attack, um, it was the same thing. Within a couple of minutes, I said um, to my friend, can you help me walk? I have to get to the bathroom because I'm going to vomit all over the table and I can't walk on my own. And so she walked me to the bathroom um, and I threw up a couple of times in there and then I managed to stagger back outside. Uh, this restaurant was two blocks from my apartment and I could not find my way back because I was so dizzy. 
Um, and so my friend drove me back, but she didn't know how to get there. And I, every time I opened my eyes to give her directions, um, the light just shocked my system and I was just spewing vomit. Um, sorry to be gross, but it's the reality. Um, she had to pull over in two blocks. She had to pull over three times so that I could throw up out of the window of the car. Got me back to the apartment, threw up in the parking lot. She walked me upstairs. I immediately threw up. Um, I couldn't, I was crawling again. Um, I made her leave me because I was embarrassed and humiliated, honestly. And, um, there was no explanation. Uh, several days later, I went to the ear, nose, and throat specialist. They gave me a hearing test. I've always had, since my early 20s, I've had hearing loss on and off. And, um, I am getting to the diagnosis. Um, so we're almost there. I'm sorry this has gone on for 45 minutes. I don't expect anybody to have watched for this long, but just in case this is useful. Um, and this was sort of the... Um, aha moment, as Oprah would call it. Um, I had a hearing test, and I expected the test to be normal, even though I have, at that time, I was having severe hearing loss in my left ear. And um, the technician gave me the test, and then I went in to see the doctor, and he held this test in front of him and said, uh, you have a very specific pattern of hearing loss. You um, you can hear in the high range and you can hear in the low range, but all of your mid range is um, basically more than 50% of your hearing is gone. And it's this pattern shaped like this. And um, he said, based on that, your tinnitus, which sometimes is um, louder than the sirens outside of my window when they drive by. Um, I live really close to a fire department. And um, so based on the pattern of hearing loss, the extent of hearing loss, and um, your tinnitus and your vertigo attacks, you absolutely have many ears disease, which is an inner ear imbalance. I had a physical explanation with a lab test that told me something is officially wrong. It was um, to, unless you've been in this situation, you, this will sound crazy, but it was the happiest moment in many years of my life because this doctor wasn't saying there's nothing wrong with you. Um, and basically, Meniere's disease, he put me on a diuretic, which force, forces fluid from your body and also from your inner ear. And that he was hoping would restore some of my hearing and improve the tinnitus. Um, it didn't. It hasn't done that. But, um, I honestly don't care. I don't care. I have an explanation for what caused the vertigo attacks and the hearing loss. And um, that was such a hallelujah, thank God, sort of situation for me um, because it was, you're not crazy. Now that also gave me confidence um, in knowing that all of this time, you know, all of these things haven't been in my head. It didn't explain all of my symptoms, but it made me think, wait a minute, you've been convinced by doctors all this time that this is all anxiety, and all this time, talking to myself in my head, you've known better. You know better. Um, and so I started looking around. Now, in the weird workings of the universe, um, the exact same day that this ear, nose, and throat specialist diagnosed me with Meniere's disease, my mother sent me an email with a scan. Um, my mom is an excellent record keeper, and I've had a lot of um, strange idiopathic, um, which means of unknown cause, illnesses from birth, really. Um, so because of that, she, she very thoroughly documented pretty much everything that was ever wrong with me medically. She was going through my medical records and she found a photocopy of a prescription that I was given in 1997. Now this is 2015. The prescription was for doxycycline, um, 200 milligrams uh, or 100 milligrams twice a day, so 200 milligrams a day for 14 days. 
And this, she said, was what you were given for when you were diagnosed with Lyme disease in 1997. And I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, and a friend of mine on Facebook, who is a professor, told me a while ago, you should be looking into chronic Lyme disease because um, a student of hers had it and she basically had multiple sclerosis types of symptoms and no diagnosis, no explanation. And then eventually she found a specialist, what's called a Lyme literate specialist, and was put on antibiotics and almost all of her symptoms improved as a result. So my friend had been telling me this, and I just thought, um, I dismissed it for the most part because I thought, you know, I'm having neurological problems, and um, a tick bite doesn't, doesn't explain it. This isn't an infection. This is a neurological problem, maybe an autoimmune disorder. Um, so I started looking into Lyme and was like, holy crap, this is, this is it. I don't remember when I was diagnosed with Lyme, but my mother remembers it clear as day. So I interrogated her about it and she said, yeah, um, you had, you, you just got really, really, really sick when you were about 18 years old. We took you to the doctor. The doctor found a rash on you. The doctor said you have Lyme disease and he gave you this prescription and then you got better. Um, so the, the, this was so important that she had the photocopy of my prescription because um, I, I know exactly how I was treated. Um, 14 days 200 milligrams a day of doxycycline doctor or okay uh, Lyme literate doctors now know is insufficient for curing a Lyme infection what it could do is um, suppress the bacteria kill off enough of the bacteria to uh, make your symptoms improve um, but it would not kill them off entirely. So here I am now, 37 years old, um, literally for half of my lifetime, I have had these bacteria, um, for Lyme disease in my body. Um, I've had a bunch of other symptoms and some of the symptoms have been psychological, including extreme anxiety and depression. Um, so when I finally found my way to my Lyme specialist, I brought all of my medical records with me, all of them, all of my blood tests, and she went through every single one of them. This was like a two hour long appointment. She read everything and she pointed out things that were abnormal on my blood tests years ago that my doctors didn't consider significant. For example, I had a very high calcium level um, at one time. I don't remember what the significance of that is, but for some reason that was significant to her. I had a very high level of um, eosinophil, which is, I think, a certain kind of white blood cell. Um, and the doctor said this, this specific white blood cell attacks parasitic infections. Um, and it was really high, and there's actually a specific range between six and seven, um, it turns out, that um, it, that correlates with Lyme disease and its co-infections. Also, um, another thing I discovered that actually sent me looking for a Lyme specialist was that there is a Lyme co-infection called Bartonella that causes specific skin problems. Now, one species of Bartonella causes something called cat scratch fever, which I had only known from an old song that I had heard about. Um, but cat scratch fever causes these um, lesions on the skin. Um, but this related tick-borne or flea um, parasitic type of infection, Bartonella, causes um, rashes on your body that look exactly like stretch marks. Now, I used to be in really, really, really good shape. I would exercise um, 
six days a week, really. Um, I since I had a little chubby period during my adolescence, but um, otherwise I've been very, very, very thin. I have never been obese um, or really even close to obese. I was overweight. I was a husky teenager. Um, but over the past five years or so, um, I've started to develop stretch marks everywhere. And there have been more and more and more. And I thought they were from weightlifting. Um, I didn't even question it. I just sort of accepted that my skin is cursed. That, which is not, it's not reasonable. It's not a logical type of thing. But because of the acne that I've had, um... I just thought, well, I just have exceptionally bad skin. Well, I have um, stretch marks on my abdomen. Um, basically, it looks like I, you know, gave birth to quadruplets or something. But I also have them on my shoulders, both of my shoulders. I have them on my chest. I have them all under my arms, on my flanks. I have them on my hips, and I even have them on my knees. I have stretch marks on my knees. And no doctor I have ever been to has ever made any comment about how odd that is. There are some specific um, uh, health problems, uh, genetic conditions like, um, well, a genetic condition called Marfan syndrome, for example, that can cause a person to develop stretch marks all over their body when they're not overweight. Um, or Cushing's disease, which is um, when you have an excess of the cortisol hormone. So really, doctors should have asked about this. I was always ashamed and, and would never bring it up and just hope to get it over with during those periods of exams when I had to, um, you know, show my body to doctors so that they could, you know, check my breathing or whatever, put on an EKG. Um, and no one ever asked me about it. I don't know if the doctors were embarrassed for me and wouldn't ask. I don't know. I don't know if they thought that maybe I used to weigh 400 pounds. I have no idea. But anyway, um, finding out about Bartonella um, and thinking, you know, it really, it doesn't make any sense. A curse? Um, I didn't think somebody had hexed me physically. I didn't think this was witchcraft or something. But I thought, you know, I just have really bad luck in this world. And... That's why I have all these stretch marks. Well, once I read about Bartonella, I thought, you know what? People do not get stretch marks on their knees. Thin people do not get stretch marks <laughs> everywhere. It just does, it shouldn't happen, should it? I don't know, but this doesn't make any sense. And all of my scars look exactly like the Bartonella rashes, except they don't look like rashes to me. They look like scars. So I found this Lyme literate doctor um, through a referral, um, and I went to her, and she reviewed my all of my blood work and my tests and stuff, and she said, okay, the eosinophil is significant, um, because it indicates a parasitic infection. Various other abnormalities, just, just, you know, minor things here and there in my, um, blood work. She, um, explained how they can be correlated with, uh, Lyme disease. Then when she saw, um, and she's, she was very sensitive and said, you know, do you mind if I look at your skin? And she also said, I have to give you an EKG because if you have Lyme, it can affect your heart and you could have a heart attack and basically drop dead. So this is something that we have to check. She didn't charge me for an EKG either, by the way. My regular doctor charges extra for that. Um, and my heart, thankfully, was fine. But as soon as she saw my skin, she said, you absolutely have, this is Bartonella. You definitely have Bartonella. Um, the, and this is significant. It's really extreme. Bartonella causes these skin rashes that look like stretch marks. And um, Bartonella goes straight to the central nervous system. It causes the majority of symptoms that I've had. She said, your Meniere's disease, um, she said I'd be... She would not be surprised if that was um, caused by Lyme or Bartonella, and with treatment that those might improve. 
Um, she said even that the stretch marks, which there's no way to ever get rid of stretch marks. Trust me, I've looked into it. I've tried all kinds of creams and gels and things. Don't believe any of them. It doesn't work. Of course, <laughs> mine, I guess, probably are um, not actual stretch marks, but um, lasers don't really work for them. So I gave up and thought, I'm going to have to live with this. I'll never go to the beach again. Um, this is a lifelong thing, so just get used to it. Get used to it. Um, and, you know, frankly, being gay, there's a lot of pressure to look um, a certain way. And um, I will never fit that mold again because of these illnesses. And that's that's been difficult as well. Um, I won't lie, but... Um, so anyway... She uh, she put me on treatment, and immediately, all of my symptoms became exponentially worse within a day. Um, within two weeks, I couldn't think. I couldn't think. I couldn't sleep. I was lying in bed, unable to... Th it was as if... Um, I don't even know how to describe it. It's living without thinking. Um, I was just like this automatic being and my skin was burning, my feet were burning on and off, my coordination, my vision was going crazy, I couldn't focus. It's a miracle that I got through work. I did have to call in um, a few days and um, my boss, thank God, has been very, very understanding of this and patient with me. Um, but nevertheless, there were days when I went to work and I just stared at my computer all day just stared at it um, without being able to think about anything. And I would think, oh, I need to start this document. And I would, um, you know, open a new document to discover that I had started this document twice already and forgotten about it. Um, it's crazy. There are so many insane elements of, of these illnesses. So um, I had a bunch of, of tests and... Um, among the test findings, there's something called C4A, which is a, um, a immune system um, complement in your blood, um, and it indicates inflammation. My level of C4A um, when I was tested was 19,800, and the normal range is 0 to 2,800. Mine is 19,800, um, and this can be correlated, it's most often correlated with Lyme disease and with mold um, infestation in your body. Now, I also knew that I have some mold in my apartment. I live in an old apartment building in D.C., um, and I've seen black mold on my radiator and stuff, so I knew that that was here. And honestly, I've been I've been too sick and tired, sick and tired, literally, to uh, worry too much about it. I just didn't really take it that seriously. Well, guess what? I found out it's also in my water. Um, I'm working on moving right now, but it's in the air and it's in the water and it's in my urine. Talking about black mold, um, which causes. Um, inflammation in your body and which can cause a lot of very serious health problems including neurological problems. So this is a double whammy. Lyme with Bartonella um, and mold. And these are the explanations to what's been going on with me. I've been on treatment with antibiotics for about two months now. As I said, the first two weeks were um, nightmarish. I didn't even feel like I was alive. Um, partly alive. Uh, you know, I may as, as well, as far as I'm concerned, have been in a coma during those times. And that would have been a welcome thing because of the pain that, um, I was feeling. That's supposed to happen. That's actually an, in it doesn't, I mean, it sounds crazy unless you know anything about Lyme disease, but, um, when you start getting treatment for Lyme disease, um, if you have it in your body, all of your symptoms immediately become worse. Um, and there are theories for this. The, the thing that people most often say 
I don't know, I'm not an expert, um, but what people say is that when the Lyme bacteria die, they break apart, they release toxins. The toxins cause inflammation, and the inflammation is what causes your symptoms. Um, and so when you basically bomb your body with antibiotics, um, you're killing, it's like a, a mass killing of these bacteria, and it pollutes your body. And there are ways to detox your body. I have never bought into um, what I've perceived as like this, you know, hippy dippy stuff about detoxing and stuff. Well, guess what? I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way. Um, detoxing your body um, actually is important and it, it really helps, particularly if you may have an infection like this. And, and so here's the kicker for a lot of people. Um, I grew up in Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia is a hotbed for tick-borne illnesses. This means um, Lyme disease. This means Bartonella. Um, although Bartonella can be carried by fleas and by other um, it biting insects. Um, Babesia, which is another infection. Um, I've had a lot of symptoms that I haven't even described, but one of them is so strange. It's, it's just totally weird. Basically, um, my legs, uh, and just like the cluster headaches, which, I mean, it, it seems almost like you're making this stuff up, um, but it's like clockwork. The cluster headaches always happened at 7 o'clock p.m. or 3.30 p.m., without exception. Um, almost without exception, um, on certain days in clusters, um, usually for days or weeks or even months at a time, um, between 3, eh, usually 3.30 to 4.30 slash 5 p.m., um, my legs start to feel hot. This always happens at work, and so I walk around at work and show people how weird this is. My legs like physically get hot and when I lift up my pant leg they're bright red they they are almost this color um no joke they really are and they're they swell up they get hot to the touch they feel hot they burn they itch and then um by five o'clock back to normal well, this is likely caused by yet another Lyme co-infection called Babesia, which is a parasitic infection that gets into your red blood cells, and it has a life cycle similar to um, the parasite that causes malaria. And so it becomes active um, at certain times of the day. It has a circadian rhythm, just like you do, just like I do, just like all animals and all plants do. And um, it's totally bizarre. You know, it feels like, um, I'm trying to think, whatever that move, invasion of the body snatchers. It's like these little tiny creatures have taken my body hostage and they're in control of it as much as I'm in control of it. Um, so it's, it's really, really crazy. But um, anyway, as I was saying, I'm from Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia is one of these places in the country and the world where um, Lyme disease and these other co-infections are um, not only common, but they're regarded as an epidemic. Uh, the tests for Lyme disease, anybody who thinks that you may have Lyme disease, um, you need to... People told me this, and I had myself tested for Lyme, and the, the Lyme test came back negative. There are two tests. One is called ELISA, E-L-I-S-A, and the other is called the Western Blot Test. Um, one of them, I don't remember which is which. Um, so the first test that they give you is ELISA, and ELISA is, it returns a false negative um, I think about um, more than 50% of the time. And it's not, it's not sensitive at all. So basically, it's like flipping a coin. If you do have Lyme, there's a 50-50 chance that it will tell you you have Lyme. The problem is that that's the first test doctors give you because that's what CDC says to do. So 
If you have an ELISA test and it's negative, your doctor says you don't have Lyme disease. So that's good. You're lucky. We've ruled that out. That's not correct. More than 50% of the time, that test returns a false negative. Um, the state of Virginia in 2013 passed legislation requiring, mandating, that all doctors who suspect a patient may have Lyme disease or patients who go to a doctor suspecting they may have Lyme disease, doctors are supposedly, well, by statute, they're now required to say, we'll give you this test if you want it or if we think that you should have it, but you need to be aware, if it says that you're negative for Lyme disease, you may still have Lyme disease. And yet, these tests are used uh, to determine whether or not a person is eligible for treatment for Lyme disease. Just think about that. Just think about it. Um, so CDC says give the ELISA test. If the ELISA test is positive, remember 50-50 chance, so the 50% or so of people who um, test positive for Lyme uh, with ELISA, then they're supposed to have the second test called Western blot, which is actually, I think, so I may have these mixed up. Again, I'm not a scientist, um, but um, the, the second test is the Western blot test, and um, it's more sensitive, I believe, than the ELISA test. And so first you have the less sensitive test, the less accurate test. Um, and then CDC says, okay, well, that test could be wrong. It's less likely to be wrong um, and say, it's less likely to say that you're positive when you're not positive than to say you're negative when you are positive. But anyway, um, so CDC says, okay, well, if somebody has the ELISA test and it says they're positive, then they have to have the Western blot test, which is, um, I believe, wrong 30% of the time. That also has to be positive in order to treat for Lyme. And then your doctor is only supposed to give you a maximum of 30 days of um, an antibiotic, which is supposed to be doxycycline. It's not um, sufficient. It is not sufficient. It, if you have had Lyme disease in your body for um, any length of time, that's not going to kill it. That will work. Um, it seems, based on research, I've read, <laughs> I've read a lot of research, and I read the research available from NIH. What's really fascinating is that CDC says there is no such thing as chronic Lyme disease. It does not exist, period. Once a person has had 30 days of doxycycline, they are healthy. They no longer have Lyme disease, period. Despite symptoms, despite tests, if a person continues to test positive, according to CDC, they don't have Lyme anymore. That's a fluke. They don't have an explanation, but they don't have Lyme anymore. Um, people still have symptoms. They call that um, post-treatment Lyme syndrome or something and say, well, they're cured and we have no idea why, but even if they test positive, even if they still have symptoms, they don't have Lyme disease. Um, meanwhile, if you look at NIH, another government organization that is charged with research and not with setting regulations and which does not have the affiliations with pharmaceutical companies um, and politicians that CDC has, NIH has published a number of studies on chronic Lyme disease, which CDC says doesn't exist. Um, it does. None of this makes any sense, and the whole bottom line point of it is that um, I've been going to doctors for five years. I did tell the very first neurologist that I went to um, because he asked me, he said, have you ever had Lyme disease? And I said, yes. My mother um, told me I was diagnosed with Lyme disease when I was about 18 years old, and um, he said, this neurologist said, well, that was a really long time ago. And I said, well, yeah, it was half a lifetime ago. And he said, well, why are you, why do you think you have Lyme disease now? I said, I don't, 
this was five years ago, I said, I don't think I have Lyme disease. You asked me if I have ever had it, and I had it. And he said, well, were you treated? And I said, yeah. Um, and he said, well, then you don't have Lyme disease. Like, and it was as if he was angry at me for, I don't, for answering his question. I wasn't telling him I had Lyme. At this time, I was thinking, maybe I have MS. Please help me find answers. Um, but he said, well, okay, well, you don't have Lyme disease because you would have, you're treated. You were treated years ago. And I was like, okay, <laughs> moving on. Um, you're the one who asked me this question. So um, this did come up. This came up in our medical um, process and our diagnostic process over the past five years. The second neurologist I went to reviewed my records and he said, oh, well, I see that you've um, had both of the Lyme tests. You've had the ELISA and Western blot tests. That's one of the first things I would do. But since you're negative, that's good news. We know you don't have Lyme. So um, the thing is, most doctors, um, they, you know, CDC is, is, what sets regulations that medical boards follow. And most doctors, you know, they're not, um, this, this isn't denigrating doctors, but most doctors are not researchers. It isn't their job. They do, they act according to protocol. And the protocol for Lyme disease and the common knowledge because of that about Lyme disease is that, um, you know, you have the tests and if the tests are negative, that's great. It means you don't have it. But the reality is that the tests are very, very, very inaccurate. And um, so it's hard to find out in the very first place that you have Lyme. Um, my, the way that I look at, at my body is that I have been disfigured. Um, I'm really covered. I'm covered in scars. Um, from my head down to my knees, uh, from acne scars to these Bartonella stretch marks, which are, um, they're called rashes again, but they, you know, it's devastating. And in a certain way, I'm really, really, really lucky that I have those because that is a, um, a doctor, a Lyme literate doctor can look at that and say, you have Bartonella period. Now, if I weighed 350 pounds, then they wouldn't say that. They would say, oh, you know, you've got a lot of stretch marks. But that's just not the case. Or if I were a huge bodybuilder, but I mean, look at me. No, I'm a scrawny, um, 5'11", 155 pound gay guy, you know. <laughs> um, so, I've gotten off track. But anyway, the bottom line is that after all of this time, um, I found out that, that I do, in fact, have Lyme disease, and I'm being treated for it. Um, the first couple of weeks were terrible. Um, fortunately, the doctor warned me that that was going to be the case. Um, one other thing I will mention that she warned me about, which was really important, was, um, and she gave me a couple of, of medical journal articles. She said... Lyme and Bartonella affect your brain. They go to your central nervous system. They actually cause inflammation in your brain. Your brain goes from this to this, okay? That doesn't show up on an MRI. MRIs are looking at the electrical signals in your central nervous system. They're not looking at the tissue um, there are other tests that can look at that, but they're, you know, they're less common and normally based on these sorts of symptoms, nobody would order those tests. But when your brain goes like this, um, all of the wiring is, is uh, there's pressure applied to it, the wiring being your nerves, and that causes anxiety. It physically causes you to be in a state of high anxiety. It causes you nerve pain. It causes sensitivity. Um, and so she was saying, you know, your, your anxiety issues, uh, of course, some of them have had to do with being ill. And some of them have had to do with um, 
the frustration over um, everything that's happened in your life from, yeah, from your job. You, if you have a stressful job, okay, you're, you're going to have some anxiety. But going to all of these doctors and being told that you're totally well when you're very, very ill, um, yeah, that's going to cause some anxiety. But she said, don't, don't uh, get it twisted, basically. Um, the anxiety caused by brain inflammation is so real, it can actually cause um, psychotic states at some times. It's just that physically real. It's a physical cause of psychological issues. And she said, so when you start taking antibiotics to treat your Lyme, um, you should expect a flare-up of symptoms. You should expect you're going to have a lot of pain. You're going to have joint pain. You're going to be so tired. You may not be able to get out of bed. She said, you know, you may need a note to get out of work for a little while while you're recovering. Um, but she said, also, you need to expect you're going to be, um, you very well could experience um, panic attacks. You could be so stressed out. Well, she was totally right. Um, I was unable to think for a while. I was in excruciating pain from joint pain to uh, nerve pain in my legs and feet that came and went to numbness in the left side of my body to um, skin pain. All of these stretch marks, um, they felt like they were on fire. I mean, physically burning for the first two weeks of my treatment. Um, it was it was kind of a living hell, but a lot of my life has been over the past five years. And um, the doctor warned me and said, that's going to happen. Well, anyway, um, I don't have a happy ending yet, but two months into treatment, not two weeks, not two weeks on doxycycline, but two months on a number of different antibiotics. Um, this treatment is actually similar to chemotherapy um, in the way that it, it just takes such a huge toll on your body. A huge toll on your body. Um, but it's slow progress. If you've had an infection in your body for 18 years or longer, maybe, um, as I have then you shouldn't expect to be cured in two weeks, and you're not. But um, I guess I had a sort of breakthrough, it seems, over the past couple of weeks, and for the past week and a half, uh, my energy has been, God, I don't know, 20 times greater than it's been in years. Years. Um, I don't feel like all I can do is sleep and lie in bed anymore. I feel like I can actually get up and do things, um, including look for an apartment that isn't infested with mold, um, which my doctor told me, you need to move. That was part of my prescription. She said, you are going to feel so much better once you get out of a moldy environment. So this was an epic video, way too long. I'm sorry for that. I'm sure I could have made it more... Um, concise, and maybe I'll try to do like a just shorter forms of this uh, for anyone who doesn't have an attention span for an hour and a half. I'm sorry. But um, the bottom line is all of these things started out as thinking I probably had multiple sclerosis, went through a zillion doctors, um, found out that I have Lyme disease and Bartonella, which is just as significant as far as its toll on my health, and nobody ever thinks about Bartonella. Lyme comes up once in a while. Bartonella never comes up, and it's very prevalent. And, um, and I have uh, mold throughout my body, black mold, which causes inflammation. Remember that, that um, C4A number I gave? 19,800, when the normal range is 0 to 2,800. That is from inflammation, and that can be caused by mold, and it can be caused by Lyme. It can also be caught, could also be caused by um, anything from lupus to HIV, but in those cases, usually um, another 
immune complement called a C3D is also elevated. Mine is not. When the C4A is isolated um, or is high elevated in isolation without the C3D being high, then it's usually Lyme disease or mold. So that's something to look into. That's something to ask your doctor to test you for the C3D and the C4A if you're having any kind of problems like these. Um, the reason I feel compelled to make this is because um, the CDC said last year they've been estimating that the rate of new infections of Lyme disease um, were 30,000 individuals per year. Um, last year, they said that they vastly underestimated that and that cases are underreported. And their new estimate, which is probably still conservative, is that it's 10 times greater than they've said. So that means 300,000 people just within the United States per year contract Lyme disease every year. Our population is 300 million, 350 million in this country. So that means one out of every 1,000 people in this country contract Lyme disease each year, which means cumulatively over the years, your odds go up and up and up and up and up. And it can take a really long time for you to notice the symptoms affecting your life. Not everyone gets the bullseye rash or any rash. I did have the rash back in 1997, um, but not everybody gets it. Um, not everyone who does get it sees it because it can be on your back. It can be on the back of your leg. It can be somewhere where you don't um, look at your body or can't see. So you may overlook it. You may think you have the flu and then that passes. Well, guess what? 5, 10, 15, 18 years later, you may be disabled and have doctors telling you it's all in your head. And um, I promise you, you won't believe it. But after years and years and years of hearing it, you probably will start to think, wow, maybe I'm crazy. Because that's what happens. You start to think, well, you know, if I were crazy, <laughs> I wouldn't know that I was crazy. So that's a scary thought. Um, but this has happened to so many people, so many people, people who have lived with Lyme disease for many years. It also happens to people with MS and there may actually be a link between Lyme and MS, but I'm not going to get into that, um, right now anyway. But, um, so many people who have lived with Lyme and MS for many years do exactly what I've done. They go from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. They get a little bit of a lead. They get these strange little anomalies um, that show up on tests, just little blips. But because those blips don't fit into the standard puzzle, the doctors tend to dismiss them. It's not always the doctor's fault. However, I guess the last thing that I will say is um, a plea to anyone from the medical community um, is, you know, first of all, do take your patients seriously. I know you're busy. I know you have to deal with insurance. Um, I know that there are protocols, and I, I know that um, things are very complicated, but you have to take people seriously, and you have a responsibility not to dismiss anything that you don't understand as being anxiety. Because I have learned through these years that is the standard now. Um, when doctors probably should be saying, we don't know what's wrong with you, most doctors in my experience and in the experience of a lot of people I've met through this process, um, learn that most doctors say, you know what, something is wrong with you, but it's here. You should really learn to relax. This is anxiety causing your problems. Um, you need to be a little bit more open-minded because as a doctor, despite what you've learned in medical school, um, 
Just bear in mind, science progresses, knowledge progresses. You may not be conducting research yourself, but new research is always being done. And at no point in history has medical science known everything that there is to know. But it seems like at every point in medical history, most doctors believe that everything that is known is everything that there is to know. And that is a failing, in my opinion. That is a medical um, lack of competence because you need to keep that door open for things that are not yet understood. That's part of your obligation. Um, it's part of being a scientist. It's also part of your compassion for your patients. Trust me, when somebody knows that something is wrong with their body, something is wrong with their body. And that's just the bottom line. So it's been an hour and a half. I'm going to be late for work. Um, but I felt compelled and obligated to make this video, so I hope it's helpful for somebody. And um, apologies for making <laughs> a feature film length uh, testimonial, but this is, this is my life, and um, it's been a journey. Thanks.